welcome to Historically Speaking. I'm your host, Michael Dwyer, and our guest for this episode is Joanna Tebbs Young, a columnist and historian and freelance writer who has been featured for some time now in the Rutland Herald with her column, Remember One. Remember When? <laughs> and welcome, Joanna. Thank you. And today we're going to focus on three of her favorite topics. I can't really say they're favorites because it was difficult for her to choose among the various topics that she has researched, but these are the three that we are going to focus on today, and I will let you take it away from there. Okay, thank you. Um, so the first one I wanted to uh, focus on was uh, the uh, dress factory in, on the corner of State Street in Cleveland that um, is now quite a sight for sore eyes. Um, but uh, it, it is such an interesting building and I really wanted to um, look into its history. And so um, for m most people, they might know it as the uh, Linda, Lee, Linda Lee factory, which it was until 1987. Um, but before that, uh, its history goes back uh, 100, at least 100 years. So um, Rowland was actually quite a center for garment uh, making back in the, um, at the end of the 19th century. And uh, the reason was, um, it was a hub uh, there, because of the trains and the banking systems um, and also uh, a good pool of immigrant workers. Uh, it became uh, kind of a, a, a site for industry here, but particularly garment workers because um, the wives and daughters of the uh, quarry workers and the, um, the, the railroad workers w were needing work and they were, came, they were seamstresses. Um, so the garment industry kind of just kind of grew up here. Um, and so it kind of started in 1886, a shirt making factory uh, opened on West Street. Uh, but then they uh, moved to uh, the location of State Street in Cleveland uh, um, in 1896. Um, and, and at that time, they hired two hundred. They were hiring two hundred girls. Um, but five years later, 1918, there was a fire, um, destroyed that factory, and they built a three-story stucco building. Which it, it is the the remains of it is the part that is at the back of that factory uh, on Cleveland. You can't really see now, but it, it fell down in the last I don't know when, but pretty recently. Um, so that was the original factory on that site. Um, and then there, um, so that it continued to be a garment factory during that time. And um, in, so, so we'll just stop there for a second because then we have to talk about a man named Louis Kazon. And uh, Louis Kazon was a Polish immigrant who came from, uh, he, he had, um, he worked in New York City in the garment <clears throat> industry. And in 1919, he came to Rutland and he was um, managing a shirt making, a women's shirt making factory. Um, and he uh, was uh, so successful that he opened his own uh, business and um, he was working with New York companies. They were, um, they were commissioning him or he was selling and, um, he became so successful that he actually uh, built his own building in West Rutland, which is the Kazon block, which is still there. It is um, now on the historical register of um, the National Register of Historic Places. <clears throat> and um, he, at that point, went into business with a New York uh, garment uh, maker named Alv Albert Rosenblatt. Great name. And um, so they together um, opened a factory in Pulteney. And at some point, the, the Kazon dress factory uh, business merged with Rosenblatt. And that was in 1942. So we, we had quite a span there of uh, 30 years where Kazon was just 
becoming very uh, successful and um, the business was just running great. So during that time, the uh, factory that was located on Cleveland, the corner of Cleveland and State Street, had continued to be a garment factory. Um, but at one point, um, the Spaldings, uh, during the 30s, the Spaldings opened the, that, uh, they ran that business and they ran a car dealership in the first floor. And there was a pajama factory, they called it a pajama mill. Um, it was the Marvel underwear business was running on the third floor. Um, <clears throat> in 1943, um, the Rosenblatts wanted to expand their business even further, and they ended up build, buying that building. And um, because in 1943 and, and through the 40s, um, as the men were coming back from war, there was more <clears throat> uh, need for jobs. And so they expanded. They looked to Rutland for this. And um, so in 1943, the, uh, the, dress, the, Kazon, the Rosenblatt sorry, uh, business moved into that location. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, they were so uh, uh, successful that they needed to grow. And by 1948, they had built the building that we see today, mm -hmm. that giant building. Yes, there it is. Um, so. Um, they became one of the biggest employers in Rutland region and one of the largest clothing manufacturers in the country. Um, and um, so the, this building was built in the modern, modern style and it was a huge, compared to um, the factories that normally <clears throat> were around, it was well lit, it was airy, it had a cafeteria for the workers, it was a very modern kind of place. And um, they just were doing an incredibly well. They, um, and, and Kazon was unusual that he wanted to ha his workers to be unionized um, he, because he had worked in the garment factory and he had seen how badly the workers were treated. He absolutely wanted his workers to be part of a union, which is incredibly unusual for an owner to um, want that. Um, so the shop, the fact, the, the um, dress shop was represented by the International Ladies Garment Workers Union and more than uh, 500 employees worked there, men and women, and they were shipping out thousands of dresses. Um, and um, let's see, the, the brand was Rose Day. Uh, dresses and these were cotton day dresses and house coats and they at um, per week at its peak they were shipping out 27 over 27,000 dresses hmm. <clears throat> and um, they were like this dress was sold at Saks Fifth Avenue so I mean they were not low quality dresses they were a really big deal so Roland was like really dealing for the upper crust you know mm -hmm. um, and so everything was going great, and, but suddenly in 1964, the factory suddenly closed, and um, I was not able to find exactly why that was. Um, it was very, it happened suddenly. Um, but uh, another company came right in, um, Liz of Rutland uh, was the name of it, but it was a non-unionized company, and the, he employed the same people, but they were not unionized, and there was all this conflict, and he ended up be being found guilty of unfair labor practices, mm -hmm. and um, it closed within two years. Um, immediately again, a New Yorker came in and opened Linda Lee's Fashions, which is the, the, the place that most people remember, and they were making formal dresses. So that was in 1966, and they were doing great for 20 years. And um, they were, especially in the 70s, um, they were employing uh, over 200 people. And um, then uh, you go into the 80s and everything, industry was moving overseas and it was a victim of this. And by 87, 1987, on its, basically on its 20th anniversary, uh, it closed. And that was the last time it was in operation. And that is 
what we see today is the result of that. Was all of this um, a revelation to you as you dug in and just in terms of the numbers of people employed, the output of the factory? Oh, it was mind-blowing. I had no idea. You know, you th you, I moved here in the 80s, and so it was in operation when I first moved here, but I had no, you know, I wasn't conscious of it. But it was right at the time when Rutland started to, you know, go downhill right in the 80s, and, you know, and to see how that this was part of that, like I landed here um, right as all of this was happening, mm -hmm. To, to know that that wasn't always the way and that Rutland was actually incredibly busy. I mean, I knew it had been mm -hmm. from the railroads and, and the quarries, but um, in terms of sewing, like it had never even occurred to me. And it made me feel so much better about that building. Because um, it's, I mean, for us in a modern eye, it's not even, it's a hideous, ugly piece of architecture. <laughs> I'm sure some people will think so, but you know that whole '40s modern mm -hmm. star is not pretty, um, and so you know you kind of dismiss it. Um, but to to suddenly to know this, it puts life back into it, and it gives it context. and And to see pictures like that of the the cars, um, you know, they were all there with their mm -hmm. '40s and '50s cars. It mm -hmm. it just in to, it was what people knew here in town and it gave, it was part of this town's life. It's part of a, a, a larger um, economic shift uh, in American goods, uh, overseas exports, but also uh, I think it, it reflects a change in clothing when you said that they were making formal dress, yep. um, et cetera. But it's wonderful that you were able to focus on this within the larger context of this. And knowing you, there's more to a personal story um, and probably might have to do with individual family finances. I grew up in Fall River, Massachusetts, which was the second largest city in the United States for cotton mills. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my childhood, most of the original mill buildings built out of granite in the 1860s had been um, repurposed to sweatshops and outlet stores. And it's rather depressing for me to go back there now to see so many of these buildings empty. And that's what we're seeing here yeah. uh, with this building. And uh, what a shame that after going to all the trouble at a time when there weren't a lot of factory buildings being built, that this really didn't get enough of a run mm -hmm. for its purpose. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I learned a lot uh, from your presentation. And I, I knew coming here maybe five or seven years before you did, um, into Rutland. I was only aware of this on the periphery and had right. no idea uh, the extent to which this industry was thriving. Now we go from one end of the economic spectrum to your next topic, uh, which is the poor farm. Yes. Uh, and uh, let's talk about that, and what that reveals <laughs> about life back then. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the poor farm, um, there was uh, poor farms throughout Vermont, uh, throughout the country, um, and they grew out of the um, Elizabethan poor laws in England. And um, so the, the first poor houses, poor farms, they kind of, you know, into, in, uh, you can use both terms. Um, they began in 1816. Before that, the poor, uh, the crippled, the insane were jailed or killed or, you know, it's just beyond us to think of that today. Um, but at, at some point, um, the, the in, so in 18, sorry, 1816, um, there were these laws that, um, 
said that, quote, the inhabitants of any town in this state may build or purchase a house of corrections or a workhouse in which to confine and set their poor to work. And such a house may and shall be used for keeping, correcting, and setting to work vagrants, common beggars, lewd, idle, and disorderly persons. So um, Rutland's poor farm opened in 1831 uh, near, near the Rutland quarries. The, I'm sorry, the West Rutland quarries quarries and um, various throughout the state one by one different towns uh, they began to open and this is Rutland's not the first one this is the one that opened um, near what is now the high school on Gleason Road in 1875 and um, the the people who lived in these uh, places were called inmates which is awful in itself. Um, and many of them were born and died there. Um, and um, the, 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 those who died there um, in 2008, so we're just zooming forward a little bit here. In 2008, um, the poor farm cemetery was uncovered because it had been lost um, underground, uh, you know, it had been grown over. And, um, in 2008, it was uncovered and they did a lot of work on it and they put up a memorial for these people. Some of them, there was only 32 of them, I believe, that were named. Um, some of them were children, um, <clears throat> some were convicts, um, and, but many were lost forever. And there's also the, the uh, cemetery over by the uh, North uh, West High, uh, School as well. Um, so that was also brought back to life a little bit. Um, but other people, so the, those are the people who died there, but other people um, just would go there when they were down on their luck and uh, they would be there temporarily. And it, it tended to increase during the winter months after the heating fuel ran out. And so um, young men and their families would move in until they could get work again. Um, and one of the places um, where people worked was actually at the Castleton uh, town, a poor farm, which had a potato field. And this is a, a picture from that. Um, I'm not sure what year. It looks like 1910-ish, I would say, 1915. Um, and that potato field is now Crystal Beach. That's where that that farm and the 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 field was. Um, so um, in 1918, the, the the conditions of these poor farms were atrocious, and they were often their idea of caring for them was actually there was a lot of discipline and. Um, and in 1918, the, Vermont passed a law that no children could live in the poor farms. And so they were instead sent to the Brandon School for the feeble-minded, <laughs> um, which I don't know how much better that is. But, um, and, and that was kind of the beginning of uh, more regulations that Vermont passed. And um, charity, uh, more tr charity organizations started to come into being, such as the Red Cross. And um, so the Rutland Old Ladies Home was established up on uh, North Main Street and Waterbury State Asylum. Um, and so by, by the 1920s, going into the 30s, the poor houses really were for people who didn't um, go into any of those other mm -hmm. categories. Um, the Poor far starting in Heartland, Vermont, in 1938, um, poor farms began to close, and Rutland was incredibly late. It was the second to last poor farm that closed in 1966, mm. which is just amazingly late. Um, and, and just a year before the 1967 Welfare Act, where um, the uh, care for the poor and elderly and infirm was taken over by the states. By, by the individual state. So, um, but if you drive around, you'll see roads that say Poor Farm Road mm -hmm. there. St st that, that history is hidden back there. In going back to the ancestor of the American Poor Farm laws, the Elizabethan ones that you cited, 
The other thing within that language is that the poor were somehow thought of as having a moral failure. Right. And with their incarceration, there was this constant um, reminder that they couldn't be idle. So they expected people that were infirm, arthritic, probably in various stages of senility to still work. And, and I think probably the most extreme version of this workhouse mentality is when you think of what happened in Ireland mm -hmm. um, with the failure of the potato crop and as a last resort, people would have to go to the workhouse. In, in my own family, I found an example um, in my mother's family of her immigrant great-grandfather who left, uh, he was an orphan in England, but tracing back his father, his father died in a workhouse alone, mm -hmm. having outlived two wives, nine children. It's one of those things that when we realize that things like this can be part of our own past, um, it really hits home. Did you ever see uh, the movie Growing Up, The Miracle Worker? No, with uh, Anne Bancroft and a young Patty Duke. But part of the backstory with flashbacks is that Helen Keller's teacher, Ann Sullivan Macy, lived as a child in the Tewksbury Alms House. So if you can get that movie on <laughs> Netflix, I will just tell you that some of the most haunting scenes mm. in that movie are how children and uh, tubercular uh, people mentally ill were all housed together. And that's one of the really brutal things about that, about that system. And segueing to a much more pleasant topic, <laughs> uh, appropriate for us at this time of year, is <clears throat> what you wrote about falling for Vermont. Yes, yeah, so um, as we know, Vermont is a brand, <laughs> and it has been for um, a number of years, and it was not um, by accident. Um, so Vermont had been a tourist attraction, if you could call it that, um, since the early 1800s. Um, people would come here uh, for at first for the mineral springs, for, to, for the, um, I just did an article on the, the water cure mm -hmm. um, in Brattleboro. Um, so they were, people were coming here for those, but they were also coming to the lakeside resorts that were starting to um, pop up at, at first by carriage, and then they started to come by train after the 1850s. And um, so it was known, and it was a place to come in the summer. Um, it, this was fascinating to me the the in the late 1800s there was a, a change in the way that Victorians thought that they the um, aesthetics that pleased them Vermont fell out of favor because it was just too pastoral they wanted New Hampshire's craggy you know, I've only recently gone to those mountains within the last year, and I was just blown away. And I had just written this article, and I was like, oh, it was that kind of um, majestic, craggy look that the... Um, Old Man of the Mountains yeah, type exactly. thing. Yeah, exactly. And I think on uh, PBS, they just have done a they've just done a thing about that, that it was to do with uh, some artist who made that all happen. I have to watch that. But um, so, and, but also main attract, there were attra attractions that were happening where uh, elsewhere in New England, uh, that people were going to Maine and they were starting to go to Newport, Rhode Island and that kind of thing. And Vermont just fell out of favor. So not only were they losing their tourists, but they were losing at the same time their population the farmers were leaving uh, and the because Vermont's land was it, it's very rocky I've also done a, an article on the rocks and all of that um, here in the state how they had to clear them all of the rocks and the and um, the trees that we see today were not here it was just fields and but it was a very hard place to farm and so the, the farmers were abandoning their land and uh, by 1872, the Vermont State Board of Agriculture was like, 
oh goodness, this is, you know, this is getting a bit nerve wracking. And so they were trying to get the farmers to stay or to get new farmers to come in. They, they were um, recruiting farmers, particularly from Sweden. Hmm. Um, but it just was not happening as they, they needed to be doing something to increase the uh, population of Vermont. So um, by the well, well the, by the late 1800s, they were trying to still push, they were trying to get the uh, tourism, it increased the tourism. But by the 20s, they were really, really concerned. And Dorothy, uh, the author, Dorothy Canfield Fisher, who, you know, we have a little bit of an issue with now, um, was uh, writing about this uh, because she was worried that there wasn't enough money to, for the, to support the education of Vermonters and the social needs of Vermonters. And so the, there began this um, effort to sell the state. And at first it was still trying to sell the summer part of Vermont. Um, but then they, they realized they could sell fall. And um, it be, this, this is a, an ad from the 30s, I believe. And um, so they, they started um, putting advertisements out for the foliage, which it was never really a thing before. And by the, um, so by the 30s, they're, they're putting ads out and, and foliage reports begin. And they're really pushing this whole idea of traditional Vermont this, that never really existed. Mm -hmm. The idea of the farmers on the land and, and really pushing this pastoral thing. And, um, and then by the 40s, you've got the magazine Vermont Life and it just pushed it to, you know, to uh, even a bigger way. And also, so Route 7 had been built by this time. Most, many people had cars and so they could come up here for a weekend and um and then they started doing pushing this whole idea that you could take part in the farming and the, so apple picking happened and um the roadside stands and this this is a roadside stand from um bennington uh from the 30s and the department of agriculture was actually helping farmers make them showing them how to make them more attractive and my favorite part of this is the irony that if the farmers hadn't left the land, then the trees would not have been able to grow back and there would be no foliage and mm -hmm. no apples. And so I just love that little bit of irony about that. Um, and as we come full circle with this, uh, after the devastating floods uh, that hit so many parts of the state, uh, we were hoping to have a bit of a rebound and, you know, day by day when we watch uh, the news, we're probably past peak um, in most places, but um, I think it's been a good season, and this is uh, a vital staple um, of our economy with all of this. And, you know, part of the changing landscape is there are a few places when you travel along secondary roads, you can see these things that were called tourist cabins. There are some, as you go into um, Shelburne, you know, these little, little cabins, and that was part of the rustic nature of all of this. And the other thing that I've seen in uh, past advertisements is that people that had extra rooms would put these signs out on their porch that would say, tourist home. Mm. And part of uh, what's so different about this culture um, you know, perpetuated by Vermont life in the late 40s is that you would just get in your car and go. You didn't book your online reservation. Okay. So part of the adventure of it is that you would just hope that you could find a place to stay. So once again, thank you for giving us some of the larger scope of this topic. And I hope that with your continued research, that uh, maybe at this time next year you could come back um, to share with us to. three more of these investigations. So once again, thank you, Joanna, for thank coming you. here today. You're welcome. Thank you.